Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're very lucky to be joined by Steve Carlop, who's come down to us from uh, UC Davis. Uh, and Steve uh, did a BA in physics at Harvard and then uh, went to UT Austin for his PhD. Um, he then did a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. Uh, and then after his postdoc, uh, went to uh, UC Davis and has uh, remained there in a teaching capacity ever since. Uh, he is a uh, fellow of uh, the American Physical Society and the United Kingdom's uh, Institute of Physics. Uh, in 1998, he published a book that's very relevant to today's talk on quantum gravity in two plus one dimensions. And uh, his uh, research interests uh, focused around quantum gravity and uh, reconciling quantum mechanics and uh, and uh, and uh, gravity. And his uh, interests include quantum gravitational uh, basis of uh, black hole thermodynamics uh, and uh, causal uh, dynamical uh, tri uh, triangulations, which is a discrete lattice model of quantum gravity um, that shows great promise. And also spontaneous dimensional reduction from four to two and two plus one dimensions. So um, I'm sure we're going to be uh, very enlightened on these subjects today by uh, Steve's talk. So please join me and welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Let me start by saying that I'm not entirely sure what this audience is. So if you find me um, being either too complicated or too simple, please interrupt me and let me know. <clears throat> it's a little too late to change my slides, but I can change my talk a little bit at least. So let me start with a general setting and then go into some more details. The general setting has two pieces. The first of these is quantum gravity. Fundamental physics as we know it rests on two basic foundations. The first of these is general relativity, which is a beautiful and extremely successful theory of gravity that explains gravity as essentially a side effect of the geometry of space-time. The second foundational piece of physics is quantum mechanics, which lies at the basis of the standard model of elementary particle physics and all of the plausible extensions of the standard model. So quantum mechanics with its wave functions and uncertainty principle and probabilistic predictions seems also very basic. Much to the frustration of many of us, um, we have absolutely no basis for thinking that either of these foundational pieces is wrong. Um, in particular, there are certainly mysteries, dark energy, dark matter, for instance, but there is no reason to believe from those that we need fundamental changes in either general relativity or quantum mechanics, which leaves us a little bit confused about where to go to next. There is one exception to this, which is that if you try to put the two together to uh, look at physics in the regions in which quantum mechanics and general relativity are both important, the whole framework just falls apart completely. It's not just that the two theories um, are based on different assumptions and use different pictures of the universe. It's that if you just naively try to put them together, apply both of them at once, you seem to get answers that are total nonsense, not even wrong, but just don't make sense at all. It's been about 80 years since the first paper was written attempting to combine quantum mechanics and general relativity into a quantum theory of gravity. And in those 80 years, a lot of very good physicists, including at least a dozen Nobel Prize winners, have worked on this problem. But we don't have an answer yet. We have a number of interesting research programs. But actually having a theory that combines quantum mechanics and general relativity 
still seems to be a long way off. So what do we know about quantum gravity? That brings me to the second uh, foundational, the second uh, set piece of the setting of this talk, which is black holes. In the early 1970s, uh, Jacob Bekenstein and Stephen Hawking showed us that black holes are actually thermodynamic objects, that they radiate with character, characteristic temperatures, that they have characteristic entropies. The Bekenstein-Hawking entropy and the Hawking temperature both depend explicitly on Planck's constant and on Newton's gravitational constant. That is, they're both quantum gravitational. And while some of my colleagues are a little bit more optimistic, I would say that those two equations and the associated rules of thermodynamics are really just about the only thing that we know about uh, quantum gravity with any real degree of, co of confidence. Now, in other systems, thermodynamic properties reflect the microscopic physics. When we talk about the temperature of the air in this room, what we're really talking about is the average energy of the molecules of air. When we talk about the entropy, we're really talking about the number of microscopic configurations that look the same macroscopically. So it's natural to hope that we can do the same thing in quantum gravity, that knowing something about the thermodynamics of black holes might tell us something about the microscopic states and therefore about the quantum theory. So to get to that, first I'll have to tell you a little bit about black holes. Question? Yes? Um, I know we're not supposed to have questions here. Just a couple oh, of that's okay. When you plug numbers into this uh, temperature expression, what numbers do you get? Well, it depends on the mass, but for the sun, I don't remember. It's something on the order of 10 to the minus 8th Kelvin for a solar mass black hole. It's very low temperatures. Um, I wouldn't swear to that number, but way too low to measure. Um, however, the uh, temperature is inversely proportional to the mass. So in principle, if there are very small uh, black holes in the universe left over from the Big Bang, they could have very high temperatures. And there is some speculation, although it's generally not considered likely, that one class of gamma ray bursts may be the evaporation of very small, very high temperature black holes. Okay, so black holes. Um, this is, some of this may be a little bit elementary for this audience, but um, maybe not. Um, the popular view of a black hole is that it's some sort of giant space vacuum cleaner that sucks up everything within sight. This is wrong. Um, if the sun were to collapse right now to a black hole, the Earth's orbit would not be affected at all provided it wasn't a supernova that caused the collapse or something like that. And even that wouldn't affect the Earth's orbit very much. Might make it unpleasant to be here, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, so to understand black holes, it's useful to start with uh, the Newtonian picture, which is also wrong, but is helpful. Uh, Given an object with some mass m and uh, surface radius r, you can compute the escape velocity in ordinary Newtonian gravity. For the sun, I think this is about 600 kilometers per second. So now imagine that you take the sun and just start squeezing it down, making r smaller. Then that makes the escape velocity larger. And when r becomes small enough, the escape velocity can reach the speed of light. For the sun, that's a radius of about three kilometers. So the, these properties of, uh, many of the properties of a black hole 
come not from the fact that black holes are necessarily so massive, so big. They don't have to be. It comes from the fact that they're so small, that they have matter compressed into a small enough region that the escape velocity at the surface becomes very high. Now this, as I said, is the Newtonian picture. It goes back several hundred years. It is not quite right. Um, if you think about a black hole defined in this way, while it's true that light can't escape from it, a rocket could, um, escape velocity is the escape velocity for ballistic motion. Um, if you have a rocket on a Newtonian black hole, it can use part of its fuel to move out to a larger R where the escape velocity is uh, smaller and then use the rest of its fuel to escape, uh, never getting anywhere close to the speed of light. That's very different from a relativistic black hole where there's an event horizon from which nothing can escape and in which not, from which nothing can move outward. Now that's a little bit hard to think about but there's a useful analogy that was uh, suggested by Bill Unruh, who said, imagine fluid flowing through a pipe um, at a, initially at a constant velocity, but a pipe that narrows so that at some point the fluid velocity becomes faster than the speed of sound. Now imagine a race of intelligent fish trying to communicate in this flow. For the fish living outside of the sonic horizon, where the fluid velocity is less than the speed of sound, there's no problem. The sound is dragged with the fluid, but since the fluid is moving slower than sound, the sound moves in whatever direction the fish is trying to communicate. For the poor fish that has crossed the sonic horizon, though, the sound is being swept backwards at faster than the speed of sound, and therefore no sound can move forward towards the sonic horizon, and in particular, no sound can move outward. If you assume that these fish can't, uh, um, can't pass the sound barrier, then that means that nothing can move outward from this sonic horizon. Of course, this fish behind the horizon is being swept along with the fluid. And in that fish's reference frame, there's nothing odd going on. The fluid is moving, but the fish is at rest relevant, uh, relative to the fluid. The sound moves at the normal speed of sound. It's just that everything is being pulled inward. Now, substitute uh, space for fluid and light for sound, and you have a rough picture of a black hole. Um, there is one sense in which you can really think of a black hole as a region in which space is moving inward at the speed of light, and therefore nothing that moves slower than the speed of light can move out past the event horizon. There's another way of looking at this, which is really equivalent. Uh, consider a black hole and uh, two reference frames, one of an astronaut falling in and another of a rocket expending a great deal of fuel to stay at rest somewhere near the event horizon. Now, general relativity says that you can use whatever reference frame you want to describe physics, but that the laws of physics are usually easiest to understand in a freely falling reference frame. So general relativity would tell you that you right now are accelerating because you're not in free fall and the pressure that you feel of your chairs pushing up against you is simply the result of the fact that you're accelerating. It's essentially no different from the force you feel in an, excel in an elevator that accelerates upwards. So in the reference frame of this freely falling astronaut, the rocket is moving upward. And the event horizon can be thought of as the, uh, the 
point or the surface at which that rocket is moving upward, would have to be moving upward at the speed of light to remain at rest. Another more dramatic and unintuitive way of saying this, but which is correct, if you want to confuse your friends, is that the event horizon is a surface that expands outward at the speed of light while at the same time remaining the same, uh, keeping the same area, which is something which you can do because space time is curved. So this brings us to the first interesting problem with this picture. This is Wheeler's cup of tea. Sometime in, I think, 1971, maybe 1970, uh, John Wheeler asked Jacob Beckenstein, who was his student at the time, what happens if I drop my cup of tea into a black hole? In particular, what happens to thermodynamics? Cup of tea is hot, so it has a temperature. It also has an entropy. The initial state is a cup of tea with some entropy and a black hole. The final state after the cup of tea has fallen in is a black hole that's slightly bigger than the original black hole because it has the extra mass from the cup of tea. Now the second law of thermodynamics tells us that entropy always increases. But the entropy of the cup of tea is gone now. It's all just part of the black hole. So for this to be consistent with thermodynamics as we know it, it must be that the black hole has some entropy and that the larger black hole has more entropy than the smaller one. At about the same time that Bekenstein started thinking about this, um, Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking um, wrote a paper in which they showed that the ordinary mechanics of black holes obeys a set of laws that are very closely analogous to the laws of thermodynamics. The starting point of these is the second law of thermodynamics, which says that entropy always increases. The area of a black hole horizon always increases, just because things can fall in, but they can't get out. So you can think of there being some sort of analogy between um, the horizon area and entropy and see how far you can push this analogy. Well, the first law of thermodynamics says that if you have an object at a constant temperature, um, that energy and, and entropy um, are related linearly, that an increase in entropy corresponds to an increase in entropy, uh, in energy. For black holes, there is a very closely analogous law. If you think of the area of the horizon as being an analog of entropy, then there's a law that says that the change in energy or mass is proportional to the change in area with a proportionality constant called the surface gravity, which is roughly speaking what the uh, excuse me, what the force of, gravi of Newtonian gravity would be at the horizon of the black hole. So that's an analogy with the first law of thermodynamics, and then you can look at the remaining laws. The zeroth law of thermodynamics says that the temperature of a system in equilibrium is constant. The surface gravity of a black hole in equilibrium is constant. The third law of thermodynamics says that uh, well, there are a number of different formulations, but one is that you can never bring the temperature of a system down to zero in a finite number of steps. There is strong evidence, although not an absolute proof, that you can never bring the surface gravity of a black hole down to zero in a finite number of steps. So this looks a lot like thermodynamics with area standing in for entropy, and surface gravity standing in for temperature. You can do a little bit more qualitatively here. Uh, instead of a cup of tea, it's easier to work with a box of hot gas. And consider what happens when you drop that into a black hole. 
Now, the basic feature here is that in quantum mechanics, the box of hot gas has to have a finite size. In particular, if the gas is very hot, so most of its energy is just thermal energy, it has a characteristic wavelength. There's a wavelength that corresponds to any mass. Um, it's essentially h bar over t, or h bar over, uh, over the energy. And so for the box to be able to hold quantum mechanical gas, it has to have that size. So you can say, let's lower this gas to the black hole and look at what happens as it, is, as it first touches the black hole and then joins. You can figure out how much entropy the box loses, and you can figure out how the black hole changes when the corresponding amount of energy, and therefore mass, gets absorbed by the horizon. I don't want to go through the details here. We can go back to this later. But uh, um, the answer is that the change in the entropy of the gas is uh, a number of order one times the change in the area of the black hole divided by a constant, h bar g. h bar g is called the Planck area. It's about 10 to the minus 66 square centimeters. It's the basic unit of area in quantum gravity. So Bekenstein looked at this and said, well, this obviously means that black holes must have an entropy that is up to some factor of order one, um, the area of the horizon divided by the Planck area. Because after all, if you increase the entropy, you increase the area of the horizon proportionally. There were two problems with this. The first is that, at least classically, black holes have a temperature zero. The standard definition of temperature is that heat flows from hot to cold. Temperature can, uh, heat can flow into a black hole, but nothing can flow out. So if you put a, a black hole in contact with anything, heat will flow from whatever it is into the black hole. So the black hole has to have a temperature of absolute zero. The other problem is that thermodynamics ordinarily counts microscopic states, but there is a dictum of Wheeler's that black holes have no hair. That is that if you, do, if you give the mass, spin, and charge of a black hole, that determines the black hole completely. Uh, there are no other microscopic degrees of freedom there. Now, of course, this is classical. This is not quantum gravity. This is why this might tell us something about quantum gravity. But it means that for a, a while, Bekenstein's proposal was not accepted. And in fact, when Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking proposed these laws of black hole mechanics, they were very careful to say these aren't thermodynamics. They transcend the laws of thermodynamics. So in the early 1970s, again, when everything interesting was happening in this field, Hawking set out to crush this idea once and for all by looking at what happens to quantum fields in a black hole background. And what he discovered, to his great surprise, is that once you take quantum mechanics into account, black holes are not really black. That, in fact, black holes act as black bodies with a finite temperature, that they radiate thermal radiation. There are a number of ways of understanding this. The way that Hawking first looked at this was to start by considering the vacuum in a quantum field theory. Now, the vacuum is the lowest energy state, because it's the state that you can't take anything more out of. However, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells you that you cannot specify the energy of a quantum state exactly. That if you make a measurement over some time t, then there's an uncertainty in the entropy, in the energy that is at least on the order of Planck's constant divided by the time. What this means is that in quantum field theory, the proper picture of a vacuum 
is that it is really filled with virtual particle-antiparticle pairs. That is, that if you look for a short enough period in a state that you think is the vacuum state, there will be a finite probability of finding a pair of a particle and an antiparticle. Now, there are a number of different ways of describing this, but the one that is most easily compatible with ordinary relativity says that this particle-antiparticle pair have equal and opposite energies, E and minus E. Normally, you aren't allowed to have negative energies, but the uncertainty principle says if you look for a short enough time, you can. So this is observable. Um, we can observe electromagnetic interactions with virtual particles, and those give small shifts in the spectrum of hydrogen, uh, the thing called the Lamb shift, a set of other observations. This is certainly a correct picture. Now consider one of these pairs near the horizon of a black hole. Now what's going on here is that you have a strong gravitational gradient between the two particles because one of them will be typically slightly closer to the black hole than the other. The gravitational field tends to pull the two apart. You can ask just in ordinary Newtonian mechanics, how far apart they get pulled. Well, you know the amount of time. You know the acceleration. That's just the Newtonian acceleration. Um, you, you say that you're near the black hole horizon, which has a radius of 2 gm over c squared. That tells you how much the separation is going to be. And so you can ask what energy will give you a separation that's big enough that one of these particles is going to be inside the black hole by the time this lifetime is over. And you get an answer, an energy, which is essentially the same as the Hawking temperature up to factors of 8 pi. But this is hand-waving, so 8 pi doesn't matter. Um, Now, of course, you have to worry about whether this is compatible with quantum mechanics because quantum mechanics says that this ne negative energy particle can only li live for a time h bar over e. But then there's one more ingredient that goes in, which is the fact that in general relativity, time and energy are relative concepts. Um, you can roughly think of negative energy as being the same as moving backwards in time. And the direction forward and backward in time change between the outside of a black hole and the inside of a black hole. On the inside of the black hole, forward in time is towards the center, which is another way of understanding why you can't escape from the event horizon that would require moving backwards in time. So the negative energy particle, although it has negative energy relative to an observer on the outside who's measuring ordinary outside time, it can have positive energy relative to the time on the inside of the black hole. And so it evades the uncertainty principle. If the negative energy particle falls in, it can continue to live. That means the black hole has absorbed negative energy. The positive energy partner can zip off to infinity. The black hole is losing mass, losing energy, and it's radiating. And it's radiating with a typical energy, a typical temperature that this hand-waving argument gives you. So Hawking wrote this up. Um, his original title was Black Hole Explosions with a question mark. Um, Nature took off the question mark when they published it. Uh, and pointed out that um, because the temperature is inversely proportional to the mass, it's extremely low for an astrophysical black hole. But as the black hole emits this Hawking radiation, it loses mass and therefore becomes hotter. Higher temperature means it radiates more rapidly. 
you get a final explosive state where the last small amount of mass that's left gets radiated off at an extremely high temperature. Okay, so that's the picture of black hole thermodynamics. How sure are we that, yes? So, suppose the temperature is zero Kelvin. Mm -hmm. Your entropy is zero, very low minimum entropy. Uh -huh. Increasing the temperature entropy will go to the maximum. But if you further start increasing the temperature, then entropy has to go down. Yeah. To the maximum. Um, go down the entropy, the point is that you don't start with zero entropy. That a, a black hole with a given mass has a given horizon area, and it has an entropy, which is the area, a, a quarter of the area in Planck units. Then the ordinary thermodynamic processes are completely consistent. Um, the total entropy of the universe, counting the entropy of the black hole, the change in entropy of the black hole, and the entropy of the emitted Hawking radiation, the total entropy goes up. As the temperature increases, the entropy goes down, the radiation increases. It's a peculiar thermodynamic system. It has negative heat capacity. Um, as, as it emits energy, a temp its temperature goes up. But that's actually typical of self-gravitating systems. Okay, so how sure are we of this? Well, we have not tested it experimentally. Uh, we have a pretty good idea of where some black holes are, but their Hawking temperatures are way, way, way too low to measure. There are, however, these sonic analogs that I talked about, which also should emit Hawking radiation in sound, Hawking radiation of phonons. And there are a number of experiments going on around the world looking for that. It hasn't been found yet, but people who were working on that tell me within the next five to 10 years that they expect to see Hawking radiation from sonic horizons. Given the lack of experimental evidence though, this is one of the things that we can be the most sure of on theoretical grounds for a number of reasons. Partly because the derivation of the Hawking temperature and Bekenstein Hawking entropy can be done in a lot of different ways, making different assumptions, different approximations. For example, you can look at Hawking radiation as quantum mechanical tunneling through the event horizon. Uh, they all consistently give the same answer. You can also play around with parameters. You can say, what if I change the Einstein field equations? What if I change the properties of matter? What if I say that matter at very high energies doesn't behave the way matter does at low energies? So I can, ex I can change the dispersion relations, the relation of energy and momentum. I can say, what if there's some maximum possible energy? Um, I can say, what if space isn't really smooth? What if there's some granularity near a black hole horizon? You can make all of these revisions and the answer is really robust. You still get the same Hawking temperature. You still get the same entropy. <coughs> and then finally, one of the reasons we believe this is that there are a whole lot of ways of getting this answer from microscopic physics, which is my next topic. Okay, so remember where I started. Uh, we know thermodynamics of black holes. We would like to use this to learn something about quantum gravity beyond just the thermodynamic relations. In ordinary systems, entropy in particular is a measure of the number of distinct microscopic states that look the same macroscopically. And therefore, if we understood where the entropy came from, we could understand something about the 
set of microscopic states, the set of quantum gravitational states of a black hole. So how do you do this? Well, first you have to find a candidate for a theory of quantum gravity. Not so easy. Um, you need to identify black holes in that theory. And that's hard because black holes are defined in classical general relativity. In the quantum theory, it's not so clear what an event horizon means. It's not so clear what a specific location means. You have to identify quantum mechanical observables that give you information about the black hole, like the event horizon area. Once you've done that, you need to count the microscopic states. Well, if you've gotten that far, there's a reasonable chance that you can do that counting and compare that to the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. Then if you want to get Hawking radiation, you have to take your quantum theory of gravity, couple it to the rest of matter, the stuff that radiates, and see what it says about radiation coming out of your black hole. And then, when you've done all of that, you can start looking for more subtle effects. You can ask what quantum gravity says beyond just this temperature and entropy. Um, is the area uh, of, a, of an event horizon continuous or is it quantized? Uh, what happens when a black hole evaporates completely? Is there some sort of quantum remnant left? Are there further corrections to the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy? whole set of questions like that. So this sounds very hard, but these days the problem is that it's too easy. <coughs> that is that we have a whole lot of candidates for quantum theories of gravity, none of them very well established, but all of them interesting research programs at least, and they all give the right answer. Let me give you a couple of examples, one from string theory, I'll, approach, I'll focus on one of these approaches, and one from uh, a technique called loop quantum gravity, I'll focus on one approach there. So in string theory, basic idea of string theory is that all interactions and all forms of matter are states of elementary strings, one-dimensional objects, and elementary brains, higher dimensional objects that strings can end on. We know pretty well how to do string theory in the weak coupling limit, that is when the interactions are all very weak and the strings and brains are nearly uh, independent and living in a flat space and all that. We don't know so well how to do string theory when the interactions are strong. And unfortunately, if you're looking at a black hole, that's a place where gravity is strong. There's a trick, though, that was first uh, proposed by Strominger and Vafa. They said, let's look at a certain particular class of black holes um, called extremal black holes. These are black holes which have the maximum possible charge and spin um, for a given mass. Because of that property that they have the maximum charge and spin, you can express the horizon area um, completely in terms of the charge and spin. And therefore you can express the sort of standard Bekenstein-Hawking entropy in terms of the charge and spin. Or charges, typically these are higher dimensional black holes with more than one kind of electromagnetic field, but we don't worry about that anymore. Uh, so then what Strominger and Vafa said was, imagine taking this theoretical black hole and turning down the strength of gravity within the theory, just looking at the same theory but decreasing one of the constants. Well, as you do that, eventually your configuration that was a black hole melts. Uh, the gravity becomes weak enough that these things are no longer tightly bound. And so then you have 
a system of strings and membranes that are weakly interacting, but that still have the same charge and spin. We know how to handle those in string theory, so we can go and count the number of microscopic states of that system and express that number in terms of the charge and spin and compare that to the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy of the black hole in terms of charge and spin. And the answers match. There are several other ways of doing this in string theory. They all have some limits, but for at least various different classes of black holes, they work very well. Another approach to quantum gravity is a program called loop quantum gravity. Uh, the basic setting in loop quantum gravity, it sounds a little bit like string theory, but it's mathematically quite different, is that the structure of space at the smallest scales, if you're looking at the Planck area, for instance, that space consists of what's called a spin network, which is a set of lines that join at vertices. The lines are labeled by spins, one half, one, three halves, so on, with various rules about how the, the uh, spins combine at the vertices, and that's it. So that at the very smallest scale, space is just this graph, it's just this one-dimensional network, and space-time is sort of this network moving through time, so you get a two-dimensional kind of foam called a spin foam. In loop quantum gravity, the basic observables like areas and volumes are determined by what spin network you're, you have, which tells you what quantum state you're in, and what the spins are on that spin network. So for example, if you have a surface that cuts through a spin network, then the area of the surface is essentially a constant times the sum of the various spins of the lines that puncture that surface. So that gives you a picture of the microscopic state of a black hole horizon in particular as a set of punctures where the horizon crosses the lines of this uh, spin network labeled by spins. And the area depends on the total of those spins. The energy depends on some particular properties of the spin network. And so you can, so you can just write down the thermodynamics of a gas of punctures, that's this third approach here, um, at the horizon with the restriction that the total area is fixed and that the total mass of the black hole is approximately fixed. And just work out the thermodynamics and see what it gives you for the entropy. And the answer is it gives you the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. Again, even though this is a completely different picture from the string theory. So this is a problem. This is what this is an aspect of what's called the problem of universality for black hole thermodynamics. The problem is that black hole entropy counts three different approaches to string theory, three different approaches to loop quantum gravity. Uh, there's another way of getting this from what's called induced gravity. There is uh, entanglement entropy. Uh, you can say that even if the vacuum is in a pure quantum state, there are correlations between the inside of the black hole and the outside of the black hole. And if you don't know the inside of the black hole, then the outside of the black hole has some effective entropy. And there are, it actually comes out infinite, but there are ways of diddling the calculation to give you a finite answer and you get the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. Um, there are a dozen different approaches to quantum gravity that all give the same black hole entropy. Now, if you're really cynical, you say, well, of course they give the entropy. The people who are working on these knew the right answer. And it probably is true that there were some other approaches that gave the wrong answer and never got published. Um, however, 
I'm not that cynical. And even if you believe any one of these approaches, even if, say, you're a string theorist and you really like the ADS-CFT correspondence, you have to explain why that gives the same answer as Hawking's original calculation, which didn't, didn't really use any details of quantum gravity at all. OK, so now we're at the edge of current research. Um, there is a possible answer to this, which is one of the main things that I'm working on, which comes from scaling variants of black holes near the horizon. So let me explain what I mean by scale invariance. Um, excuse me. When we measure lengths or masses, we have some standard, uh, a ruler, say, that we use to, to measure lengths. How do I know that the length of a ruler doesn't change depending on where it is in space. If you think about this, this is a really tricky question because say I'm holding a ruler and you're holding a ruler, if we want to compare the lengths, we have to bring them to the same place. But if they're at the same place and the length depends on where they are, they'll agree. But then when we pull them apart, maybe they'll disagree. So it's not so easy to decide what you mean by a standard scale in physics in general. However, the real universe is definitely not scale invariant. For example, if I want to uh, set a scale for mass, I can say just use the mass of an electron as your standard and declare that the mass of an electron is just some number that's the same everywhere in the universe. That's consistent. All other mass ratios come out the same. That gives us a standard of mass. Same thing with length. You can look at the wavelength of some atomic transition. I believe the Pioneer spacecraft have a little plaque that has a picture of uh, the 21 centimeter transition in hydrogen um, to set the scale of the drawings of human beings. So the real universe is not scale invariant. There are fixed physical processes that set scales. Near the horizon of a black hole, though, from the perspective of someone remaining outside the black hole, all of those differences essentially get wiped out. Uh, all masses of, the mass of any particle is essentially zero compared to the energy scale that you need to stay outside the horizon of a black hole when you're near enough. All length scales just get washed out by the gravitational field. So near enough the horizon of a black hole, you have this local scale invariance. You have scale that can vary arbitrarily from place to place. There's a second feature of black hole horizons, which is that in some sense, they act as if they're two-dimensional. Not really literally, but in the same kind of sense that the radial direction of space um, is, becomes much more important physically than the angular direction. So if you're looking at physical processes, it's essentially enough to look at the radial direction and time. And this two-dimensional picture has been used very successfully to derive Hawking radiation, for instance, because two-dimensional uh, quantum field theory is much easier than four-dimensional quantum field theory. In a two-dimensional scale invariant, local scale invariant, or conformally invariant quantum field theory, there is this amazing and mysterious result called the Cardi formula, which says essentially that the thermodynamics, and in particular the number of microscopic states, is controlled completely by a single number that comes from the detailed properties of this scale symmetry. I do not know a good reason why this is true. I mean, I know how to derive it. It's, there's no doubt that it's correct. There ought to be some nice, deep, physical picture of why this is true. I don't know what that is. 
but it is true. So it is possible that the reason that all of these attempts to derive black hole thermodynamics with very different quantum theories agree is because they all secretly have this same two-dimensional scale symmetry near the horizon. And that's enough that the, the rest of the details don't matter. There is some evidence for this for the black hole in two plus one dimensions, that is one time dimension, but only two dimensions of space, a uh, black hole in flatland, if you like. This is called the BTZ black hole after three Chilean physicists, uh, Baniados, Tidal Boyman, and Zanelli, who discovered it. For that, in that case, you can actually do the math pretty thoroughly. Uh, you can at look at particular quantum theories of gravity. And this works. The symmetry does determine the, the entropy and the temperature. Recently, uh, Guica, Hartman, Sung, and Strominger showed that the same thing is true for a, an extremal rotating black hole in four dimensions. And a number of people, including me, have proposals for generalizing this, which are, I think, they're probably right, but not all of the details are filled in, uh, of generalizing this to arbitrary black holes. Well, if this is right, then what it tells us is that maybe black hole thermodynamics isn't going to tell us that much more about quantum gravity, which is a little discouraging. But maybe it tells us that there's a symmetry, that quantum gravity has to obey the symmetry, and that you need to look elsewhere for more clues. There are, however, a whole set of other issues about quantum gravity that come up when you're looking at black holes, which I didn't focus on because they're mostly not things that I'm working on um, and I'm not as much of an expert on these. But let me mention these quickly and then finish. Entropy is normally what's called an extensive quantity. That is, if you have a box of gas with an entropy, you take an identical box of gas and put it next to the first one, the entropy doubles. That is, entropy is proportional to volume. Now, once you introduce gravity, that's not going to be quite true because the gravitational field of one of your boxes is going to affect the other. Black hole entropy is extremely non-extensive, though it's proportional to area rather than volume. This is sometimes called holography. It's an analog to the fact that a hologram gives you a two-dimensional um, image that contains a full three-dimensional uh, set of information. And there is a lot of very interesting speculation as to whether this is a basic property of quantum gravity in general, whether even without black holes, the fundamental degrees of freedom of quantum gravity in some volume depend only on the surface. There is one setting in string theory, unfortunately, in a kind of universe that is not the one that we live in, in which this can be carried out in a good deal of detail and seems to really work. It's an open question whether it can be generalized to something like our universe. Next, there's the issue of the final state. In classical general relativity, the center of a black hole, I concentrated on the horizon, the center is singular. The curvature blows up. We know, or at least we're pretty sure, that that's not going to be true in quantum gravity, that the classical theory can't be trusted at those scales. But there's a question of what quantum gravity does with that singularity. And in particular, when the black hole has evaporated completely away, is there something left? Is there some sort of remnant? Or does the black hole disappear completely into Hawking radiation? A particularly interesting version of this, or extension of this, is what's called the information loss paradox. This has to do with reversibility. Um, in classical physics, you know the laws of physics are reversible. You can run a process in principle in either direction in time. In quantum mechanics, this is also true, that it's a property called unitarity. If you know 
the initial state, you can determine the final state, but if you know the final state, you can determine the initial state. So for example, if you throw a dictionary into the fire, if you keep track of every photon that comes out and all of their correlations and all of their correlations with the ash that's left, in principle, you can reconstruct the dictionary. Now with a black hole, it's not clear whether this remains true. You can probably create a black hole from a pure quantum state, collapse some pure state of matter, but Hawking radiation seems to be thermal, which is not a pure state. That's a, not a reversible process. If that's really true, then it's incompatible with basic quantum mechanics, and there's some indication that we need to really extend quantum mechanics. If, on the other hand, Hawking radiation isn't really thermal, or somehow the information about the initial state is encoded in the Hawking radiation and whatever remnant is left or somehow doesn't disappear, then there are some arguments that say that this requires physics to become very strange, not just near the classical singularity, but already near the black hole horizon even though to a freely fallen observer in classical general relativity, the horizon doesn't look like anything really special. This is a very active topic of research. Uh, there was a recent paper that has caused a large number of workshops over the past six months on this. Uh, we have no idea what the answer is, although Many of my colleagues would disagree. Many of them know the answer, but they know different answers. So there's still lots to do. I'll stop here. Steve, if I could start with the questions. And, um, how do we know that, uh, that the Hawking radiation has to be thermal then? Uh, what's the basis of uh, of that statement. Okay. Uh, in the standard calculations of Hawking radiation, the more sophisticated version of the hand waving argument that I gave you, you can actually compute not just sort of an average energy, but a spectrum of energies. That spectrum is uh, exactly. Uh, black body spectrum. Well, I shouldn't say exactly. It's a black body spectrum except that some of the Hawking radiation then gets reabsorbed by the black hole, but in completely predictable ways. So the calculations give us thermal radiation. Uh, many of the microscopic calculations also predict something that is at least extremely close to thermal radiation. It's very hard to get a black body spectrum if you don't have thermal radiation. Now, it's possible that this is not true. It's possible that there are correlations, but that even if the spectrum is thermal, that there are correlations between late Hawking radiation and early Hawking radiation. But this is where the big controversy has come in lately, because there's also correlations between Hawking radiation outside the black hole and the state of a matter inside the black hole. And there are various theorems in quantum mechanics that say that you can't have perfect correlations of one state with simultaneously with two others. And so if the Hawking radiation has enough correlation to explain the information loss problem, then it can't have enough correlation with the stuff on the inside of the black hole. But that means that the state near the horizon is not the vacuum state, that it's some highly excited state. And so people talk about firewalls appearing at the horizon, which is very strange because from the or point of view of ordinary quantum field theory, there shouldn't be anything special about the horizon. So we don't know. Hi. Yeah. Uh, when you were first talking about Hawking radiation, you mentioned that you could consider an object going from the event horizon to the center of a black hole as traveling forward in time. Right. 
uh, that suggests to me because of the second law of thermodynamics that the center of the black hole has to tend towards infinite entropy. So my question is if that's the case and it's the time distortion is causing it to basically be the end of the universe as far as it's concerned, does that mean that it's impossible for a black hole to evaporate before the end of the universe? Okay, so there are two pieces to that question. Uh, first of all, it doesn't require that the entropy has to become infinite. Um, it has to, it doesn't even have to trend towards infinite because as the, there's only a finite amount of Hawking radiation before the black hole has radiated away. So if you like, there are only a finite number of particles that are heading towards the inside. Um, the entropy, well, it's tricky. Um, we don't, yeah. Uh, right. Okay, so, so the basic problem with this is that uh, general relativity doesn't have absolute time. And so there are, there is a sense in which the singularity, well, first of all, it's true that the singularity of the black hole is towards the future. Um, and in classical general relativity, you could say, well, yes, you reach the singularity, you've reached the end of the universe towards the future. If the black hole evaporates, if it evaporates completely, then part of that evaporation involves the singularity gradually decreasing in size and eventually disappearing. In that case, what happens is that, is that as you approach where the singularity would be classically, you get into a very highly quantum mechanical region in which it's not entirely clear what time means at all, but in which eventually, in some pictures at least, you can come out and continue onward towards the future. So in those pictures, if it, so the answer depends on what the right theory of quantum gravity is, because it depends on what the final state of black hole evaporation is, which we don't know. Um, another possibility is that the interior of the black hole could branch off into what's called a baby universe. And you go into the black hole, you come out somewhere else. Uh, we don't know. <laughs> um, so there was a result. There was a result reported about um, people are looking at the um, arrival times of photons from a gamma ray burster. You know, which is at a cosmological distance, and they claim that the you know the photons are coming within milliseconds of each other, and they were saying that over a cosmological distance, that would imply a smoothness to space time that would even extend beyond the Planck um, uh, limit. Um, there are various phenomenological uh, models of what fluctuations of space-time would mean for the propagation of particles through the fluctuating uh, space-time. Um, they're, they're labeled by a parameter. Uh, what those observations do is to put some new, pretty sharp limits on this parameter. Um, they are probably not strong enough limits to say much about the most interesting current candidates for quantum gravity, but they're getting to the point that they're starting to put some they're starting to rule out some of the more extravagant versions. Christian, perhaps this is not a quantum gravity per question per se, but are there any interesting uh, dynamics among uh, with multiple black hole systems? Uh, oh, yes. Or, and 
interesting instabilities, stabilities, uh, event horizon collisions, and two singul singularities oh, yeah. milled. Yes, uh, and with luck in the next five or six years, we should start to see those. Uh, if you have a binary black hole system, the first thing that happens is that the orbits decay because the system emits gravitational radiation. So the black holes spiral into each other, the event horizons merge, the resulting larger black hole has a distorted event horizon which rings down to a stationary black hole with a very characteristic spectrum that mostly comes off in gravitational waves. The singularities, well, it's hard for me to say anything definite about the singularities because we don't believe the physics that describes the singularities. But yeah, the singularities merge in the classical theory. Uh, with luck, within a few years of advanced LIGO coming on, which should be in, I don't remember, two, two more years it should turn on, uh, we should start seeing gravitational wave signals of these. We don't know how many because we don't know how many binary black hole systems there are within the range of the detectors. But yes, but they vary by four or five orders of magnitude, I think. Uh, it's, it, the problem is it's not a cosmological, it's astrophysical. You have to know uh, how many binary stars are both large enough to collapse into black holes and whether one of them collapsing will shoot out the other one. Or uh, There's very complicated astrophysics, which I do not understand at all but that uh, the estimates are not good enough to tell us whether we should see a hundred a year or one every 10 years. Uh, I hope my question is elementary. It's about one of the elementary pictures of, radi well, not radiation, but pair production at the surface of the black, at the horizon. Mm -hmm. If uh, the Pair production is what reduces the uh, uh, energy of the black hole. Mm -hmm. um, why is the Hawking radiation photons rather than electrons and positrons? Ah, it is everything. Um, but the point is that there is a characteristic energy. And if the mass of the black hole is large enough, this characteristic energy is below the mass of an electron. So for large black holes, you get the radiation in massless particles, not photons and neutrinos. Uh, as the black hole shrinks, the, uh, the peak of the spectrum moves up in energy, and then you start getting everything. And uh, this picture, which is a, actually a simulation of black hole production in the event that gravity becomes very strong at the LHC, which seems not to be true. But a lot of the stuff coming out here is massive particles. Yeah. So you described an interesting, I guess, a dozen or, or so different theories that it produce the thermodynamic properties of black holes. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to go the other way and is to try to understand the underlying physics, since that, since the thermodynamics doesn't seem sufficient, how does the research community proceed in the lack of other experimental evidence? Do you just have to wait around and, and propose theories and see if they're consistent or are there some uh, other things that they can do? Oh, that's a good question. Um, There is, for the most part, the attitude of most people in this field is that if you can produce one actually self-consistent theory of quantum gravity that has the right classical limit that gives you general relativity back, that that in itself has been so hard that it's likely that that's right. 
That might not be true, though. It may be that there are a number of different possible theories of quantum gravity that are each self-consistent and each have the right classical limit. There's a whole lot of work going on in trying to figure out wh whether there are any other experimental signals that we could look at. The earlier question about the timing of photons from gamma ray bursts is one example. In some models, you have fluctuations of space at the Planck scale that are large enough that, uh, that interact with light in such a way that the effective speed of light depends on the energy. And we can start sorting those out by looking at phenomena like that. Um, there are ideas of, well, lots of sort of guesses of what quantum gravity would look like involve breaking of uh, special relativity of Lorentz invariants at very high energies. There are all sorts of places that we can look for that. Uh, for example, in synchrotron radiation from distant galaxies, if there, are, there are certain kinds of Lorentz violations that would give very distinctive signals there. Um, there are other kinds that can be looked for in the lab. Uh, there are some proposals that suggest that quantum fluctuations of space-time would lead to noise in gravitational wave detectors, which are these giant laser interferometers with a characteristic uh, noise distribution. That, I think, is unlikely, but not ruled out. So there are some possibilities. None of them are very convincing. And there is a big community of uh, quantum gravity phenomenologists who are trying very hard to come up with new ones. If we look at the um, pair production of uh, Hawking radiation, why isn't it just as likely for the positive energy one to fall in as the negative energy one to fall in so the mass doesn't change. Yeah, I, I knew somebody was going to ask that question. Uh, that actually has, an uh, has a fairly straightforward answer. The uncertainty principle tells us that outside of a black hole, a negative energy particle with some energy E can only exist for a time on the order of h bar over e. So if the positive energy particle falls in, something has to happen to that negative energy particle. For example, it can combine with another positive energy particle in another virtual pair, which has another negative energy partner, which can fall into the black hole. Or if that one doesn't, it can combine with another positive energy a uh, particle from another vi uh, virtual pair whose negative energy particle falls in. But sooner or later, you have to get rid of the negative energy particle. And the only way to get rid of it, once, a po once its positive partner has fallen in, the only way to get rid of it is for it to fall in as well, or for some other negative energy particle to fall in. Okay, yeah, if you have any further questions, I encourage you to come up and speak to Steve now. Steve, we have a, um, a special uh, Are We Alone SETI mug. Hopefully you can uh, use it when you're cogitating over quantum gravity and, uh, and uh, other such difficult questions in the future. So please join me in thanking Steve for his great talk.